I want to welcome everyone to this session. We're super thrilled from N Circle's point of view to have a, a fantastic group of uh, three gentlemen from Sanctum here today joining us. Uh, for those that aren't aware of Sanctum, they specialize in restoration, um, helping restoration contractors develop high performing sales teams, particularly in the commercial sector. Um, I've known these guys for a couple of years now, and, and they're definitely top shelf with tons of industry knowledge dating back. I don't want to give away anyone's age, but uh, we're probably talking north of, of 20 years in some cases. So lots of uh, knowledge that we're looking to share on this hour and a half session with you folks here. Um, Sanctum trains, guides, and manage restoration and sales professionals to max out the sales success of their teams. They have some proprietary information that they would love to share with you folks at some point if you're interested in learning more, especially around their uh, restoration industry probe selling uh, tools, methodologies, forecasting, and we definitely want to unpack some of that information in this session today. Without further ado, I do want to introduce the uh, three gentlemen we have here on screen. So we have Lucas, Mark, and Adam. So why don't we start with Lucas, um, and then we'll go to Mark and Adam and just do a quick introduction of who you are, and uh, then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of the session. Sounds good. Thank you. My name is Lucas Shorovsky, and I'm the founder of uh, Sanctum. Mark? Oh, that's it? I thought you were going to go on. <laughs> oh, you want me to go on like I usually do? Uh, I've been in the... <laughs> like okay, a let minute, me... I don't know. <laughs> All right, let me... Uh, so I've been in the industry for... Uh, probably just uh, just north of 20 years. Um, started out uh, by funding a technology company called Luxor CRM uh, and, and building that up in the restoration industry. I sold that company in 2016 to Nextgear, which is now CoreLogic, and founded uh, Sanctum a couple of years thereafter with the intent to focus primarily on helping restoration contractors build very successful sales teams rather than the technology aspect, but really coaching and, and changing this mindset and, and uh, perception that our industry calls marketing. Uh, that's kind of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, and uh, changing that mindset and making sure that we're investing in training salespeople and actually building professional sales individuals. Okay. I'll accept it. I'll go now. All right. So I am... <laughs> Mark Shippey, I've been with Sanctum for five years. Uh, this is my 25th year in restoration, so you weren't that far off, David. Uh, started, uh, I'm in Metro Detroit, as you can tell. Uh, some people notice my mug, go blue. So I've been here uh, my whole life. I started working for a local restoration contractor here, um, just doing a little bit of everything, kind of uh, sales, marketing, operations, production, you name it. Uh, for, we're fortunate to have a couple of big franchise companies based here. So I went to work for CRDN, corporate, spent a number of years there working with franchisees, direct sales to insurance companies, moved on from there to a company called ERS, which is now Prism. Uh, wasn't at the time, but uh, definitely did the same thing, worked with a number of franchisees, trying to help put together a national sales program. A few years at ITEL, and then the last few years here at Sanctum, and uh, I just enjoy working with lots of different restoration companies around the country, Get an idea, kind of my background working with franchisees with the same experience, a lot of small to large business owners, and people looking to grow, which is exciting. That's what we get uh, get to enjoy doing things like this. Very nice. Adam, um, Adam Figlioli, uh, I am a senior sales consultant also with Sanctum. I come packed with just a little over 18 years of uh, experience in the insurance and restoration arena. Uh, spanning a couple of different roles, I started off like uh, Mark did, uh, kind of on the operational end of things with a temporary housing vendor. Um, towards the end of my tenure with them, I actually transitioned into like a hybrid role. So actually the sales approach that I kind of take uh, is a little bit different than your conventional salesperson because I have that operational uh, kind of viewpoint. Um, so I kind of try to mesh and blend the two together. Uh, from there, like Mark as well, not that I'm trying to copy him, but I joined CRDN for a few years where I was a, a home office employee as well as representing uh, three different franchises um, in three different states. So um, managing different personalities across both the reps, the owners, as well as home office, I feel like was very instrumental in terms of, you know, trying to build that leadership experience 
um, and kind of, you know, build the uh, building blocks of, of where I am today. I'd say that my greatest success uh, was an opportunity that presented itself to be the director of sales uh, with equity potential and a cabinet and furniture restoration uh, provider, uh, which was a very niche um, avenue. Um, I was able to build, you know, with the help of the team, of course, it's never just an I thing. So we were able to build a uh, sales organization from the ground up, uh, establish a set of KPIs, different benchmarks, uh, and we were able to grow a $1 million company when I took over in 2014 to a little over 13 million and a successful uh, sale to an investment firm in uh, 2018. So uh, after that, you know, I had a stop at a national uh, TPA where I was the VP of sales, again, directing all business development and sales. Um, and that eventually led me uh, here to Sanctum and super excited to be a part of this conversation today. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, Lucas, Mark, Adam, appreciate you guys joining the session here today. So let's, uh, let's, Talk about the agenda, just to set expectations with everyone that's joined here, and then we'll get into the actual discussion. So um, what we're going to talk about today, um, and those you know in, in attendance are mostly restoration owners and sales professionals looking to dial up their strategy on the sales front. We're going to talk and unpack things to look for when hiring, uh, how to set mutual expectations, strategies for structuring compensation, and really aligning those to the desired behaviors and actions from the sales folks and then setting effective methods for goals. Uh, thanks everyone who submitted questions early on. Uh, we will have a chat in Q&A going throughout the session. So if you have any topics or questions you're looking to you know, ask us, please feel free. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. We will start by addressing the ones that were submitted, but please engage with us. We wanna you know, have a fun session with you folks today here. Uh, we won't be able to cover every session, but we or question um, during the session, but we will do our best to do so. And our, our friends here at Sanctum do host amazing quarterly webinars themselves. Uh, what we'll do is we'll post a link in the chat right now to their Facebook and LinkedIn landing page so you can subscribe to keep up to date with their sessions uh, that they're running. A few other housekeeping items before we jump in. Um, the recording here today will be sent the next business day, so that would be tomorrow, Friday there. And we also have a special offer that we will post in the uh, chat right now, as well as provide a QR code at the end of the session that Sanctum is offering to everyone who joined here today. So thank you guys for uh, that kind and special offer. Uh, with that, um, let's get into it. I want to jump into hiring and retaining uh, good business development employees to start with. So um, when, I guess where we'll start is like, when are you ready to bring on a business development rep? I'm sure there's folks in the audience here that don't have one right now. Um, so when you're talking to your clients, when do you find they're ready to bring on a business development rep? I'll, I'll tell you my yeah. quick answer is they always, they usually find out too late. That's yeah. typically what we see. Nobody ever does it when they should. It's when, they get to the point they need it. We've already missed the window. And so that that's kind of, but Adam, go ahead. That was my quick answer on that. One. Yeah. You know, I was going to say something similar. I was going to say yesterday. Um, so yesterday would be when they should have probably hired a, um, you know, a business development rep. I think from my perspective, you know, you know, through both Sanctum as well as years of being in the industry, uh, the biggest misstep that any business owner in the restoration industry can make is not immediately hiring a business development rep to represent your company out there. And obviously it's easy for me to say, right, it's another body, um, which means more money to invest, um, which could be challenging for some business owners, especially for new businesses. But um, I think that we all on this call agree that it's definitely necessary, um, you know, for every business owner that, you know, thought that they could go out, you know, be the salesperson, the operations person, the marketing person, and even on the law site themselves, for everyone that was successful at doing that, I could probably spot off about nine out of 10 that were not successful. And that resulted in them either folding or to Mark's point, finding out, you know, two years down the road that they needed a rep and that costs you two years. Um, cause a lot of, you know, your competition out there is actually investing money in salespeople and are ahead of, you know, you of where you're at. So, you know, there's two main drivers when it comes to the success of any company, from my perspective, 
operations, which everybody invests in because you have to. And then there's the sales component, which it seems like people tend not to invest in as quickly. Um, and, and I think that's where, you know, one of the biggest laps from my perspective, you know, takes course. So yeah, focus. if I can, yeah, if I can jump in, uh, I think, um, I think the natural progression of a restoration contractor that, you know, opens shop is that you've got an owner who is likely most of the time, as we're seeing in the industry will be production and operations focused. Um, they have some relationships themselves. So they naturally are the passionate person that's starting their business, which allows them to be the salesperson. And as Adam and, and Mark both pointed out, um, we tend to, in the industry, invest immediately in the operations side, but we, we lag on the sales side. And what ends up happening is you're missing the mark on making sure that not only do you transition some of the relationships that you have as an owner to somebody to nurture and maintain, but we're also not capturing the business that's coming our way and effectively and properly maintaining that business and growing. And when we start, we're kind of taking a couple of steps backwards uh, when we eventually hire a salesperson. But I think if we look at most commonly when restoration contractors do it, it's probably at that $1.5 million mark. When a contractor reaches that $1.5 million mark, they, stand, they start thinking about that, that raw. And I think that's already a little bit late. But understandably, just like Adam said, it is an investment. It's an additional head. It's, you know, there's overhead and marketing, marketing dollars that need to get spent. Yeah. And it's hard. I, I mean, also honestly, I think that's probably why most people wait is because we do it. We, the three of us do it you know, all week, all the time. We're helping companies we work with, with recruiting, interviewing, and it's difficult. I mean, it's really hard to find people that aren't really good at selling you in the interview, but they're not going to be great at their job. Or you look at a resume that looks good and kind of overlook some traits and some characteristics that maybe they have and because you're hoping and you really want it to work. And then there's opportunity costs having the wrong person. I think Adam right. said it. You just carry them for We've always carried them way too long in this industry because we're not sure. Got to give them the benefit of the doubt. The sales cycles can be long. And so by doing that, it just eats up time and resources and money. And so you go through it once or twice, people get gun shy even of wanting to do it again. But wouldn't you agree that, and David, stop us as we go too deep on this because <laughs> there's probably lots of <laughs> questions, but uh, wouldn't you agree that if you're naturally progressing as a restoration contractor, the first thing, because hiring a salesperson is quite challenging, just like Mark said, because somebody needs to manage them. If you're expecting to be, uh, you know, to be able to bring on somebody on board, that's going to figure everything out on their own and, and do it all and be effective and successful. Well, guess what? They're an entrepreneur, which means they're not going to be there for too long because they're going to have their own business. So they're going to need direction. They're going to need structure. They're going to need training and so on. And that's not something that, you know, a million dollar company is usually set up to do, which means your first hire in that sales department should be a role that takes care of understanding who our clients are. And as a new client shows up, let's make sure you're maintaining that client, staying on top of the relationships. It's partially selling but it's more account management. And that is critical. And that can be your first step into building your sales team and then effectively going kind of to the next layer, which is actually going out there and doing business development and so on. Yeah, I'd probably add on to, you know, at no fault of your own as a business owner, but it's not necessarily your area of expertise. So not knowing how to implement and deploy a successful go-to-market sales strategy. Right. Um, I that's probably a significant reason why you wouldn't bring somebody on board because you don't know what to do with them. Um, it's the owner's baby, right? I think Lucas said something similar to this, but it's your baby, right? You're just starting out. You're just getting out into the market. You don't want to hand the reins to somebody else and represent you out there. You think that you can do it on your own. And in some instances you can, um, but you know, when you're really trying to entrench your name into a given market or area, that's going to require more than just, you know, stopping by seeing people. That's going to be a part of different organizations going out and doing things at night. And if you're trying to, you know, be the owner as well, there's only so many hours, you know, throughout the course of a day and a week that you're going to run out of time quickly and other so areas maybe, of your business are going to suffer. So maybe David, maybe the question or the answer isn't, or question isn't necessarily when it's mm -hmm. into what role also right? It's a combination of timing and what are going to be the responsibilities. Because if you actively want to put somebody in place that's going to go out there and produce and business develop and so on, they're going to need direction. They're going to need structure, which is something, you know, we help provide in the industry. But 
uh, there is a stepping stone that you could do, which is more focused on relationship management and making sure that we're maintaining our existing clients and capturing them and staying on top of them. So we went deep on hiring the first business development rep, uh, but Meredith here asked a question um, from the uh, the audience. When do you look at hiring your second, third, fourth business development rep? Okay, I'll take that first. <laughs> I'm going to jump on that. Uh, so it's funny because when we, uh, so we have a, in our company, we have kind of two divisions, right? Uh, we have a division, which is our consulting practice, where we act as the directors of sales or the sales manager for the restoration company. And our responsibility is to manage salespeople, call them accountable, coach them, um, build compensation and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, and then we have a division, which is our academy division, where we actually teach all of our processes and everything. And you can find all that stuff uh, on our website. Uh, but one of the main things that we say when we get approached by a restoration contractor about potentially engaging with us in the consulting um, side of things, we're very quick to explain that in order to effectively build a team, time is of the essence, which means having two BDs is quite critical because building a sales team is kind of like pushing a train. Once you get that movement going, it's momentum, right? You don't want to pause. You don't want to stop because if you hire somebody and let's say you're not successful at that hire, but you spent, let's say 12 months figuring that out, which is you know, 12 to 18 months is the standard in our industry. On our side, we're more like 12 weeks and we can talk about why or how. Uh, but either way, if you're six months and you've made the wrong decision, you've just lost six months. So having two salespeople creates competition, number one, gives you, you know, a hedge against the fact that one of them may not work out. The chances of you being a perfect, uh, perfect at hiring is probably very slim or, or second to none, <laughs> right? So... Uh, so I think having two salespeople as a beginning start of a sales team is quite important. But again, pointing back at the first question, there is an opportunity to start with one BD, which focuses on management of existing clients. And as new clients arrive, taking care of clients rather than actively doing business development, that's kind of second step in building a sales team. And I think at that point, you want to be looking at two people, but I'll let Mark and Adam jump in on this. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, I mean, we we don't hire with the intention of people not working out and getting rid of them quickly, but it right. happens. So yeah. there's a little bit of offense and defense that goes on when you make a hire. If you're looking at two people, you're protected. You've got somebody there. Should one of them not make it? Um, ideally, they do push each other. That's really what we look for is, you know, because we see success, the other person wants it, pushes harder. First person, you know, they, they like being number one on the leaderboard. So they're going to come back. So that dynamic helps a lot. The question to go to a third then kind of depends on where you're at vertical wise. Are you focused on really specific mm -hmm. markets? And if that person's got it managing it, even if they're not where you want to be revenue wise yet, but the potential's there, the clients are there, and you want to open up and expand an area, you're going to need another person for it. So that third one, a lot of times, at least what I see is we've got two solid people. We've got the, the primary markets covered that we want to be into, like multifamily, uh, maybe agent marketing or plumber marketing, and you you feel pretty solid. Now you want to expand, but you don't want to take your people away from where you're having success and getting revenue. So a lot of times that third hire is kind of the, let's enter into a new market or maybe in a new territory, new area, uh, take some of the edges of what the first two people can't get to, to start. And then we're going to expand. And that's, that's usually what I see a lot of times. Nothing to add, Adam? Nothing to add. You, you, you both took my thunder. That's why Lucas <laughs> wanted to go first. I, I do want to <laughs> add one more thing. So we, we briefly touched on the fact that um, that the industry standard and wondering if people would agree on this call and maybe we can even poll people one day. But anyways, uh, the industry standard is that uh, an owner, a restoration company takes 12 to 18 months to make a decision whether somebody is, you know, they're going to let them go or, you know, they're not successful for some reason. We do this in a period of uh, about 10 to 12 weeks. Okay. And the reason we can do this because we're not necessarily monitoring how many jobs they're bringing in. We're paying attention to KPIs and metrics and is everything heading in the right direction? And are those things indicating that this person is going to be successful? So when you look at hiring a second person, some restoration owners will hire their first person and want to wait to see that they're successful before they spend money on the second one. And this is precisely why there's so many restoration companies 
that gets stuck at that two and a half, three million dollars, or even five million dollars, because they're waiting to add to the sales team because they're waiting for certain success. So having the ability to understand if somebody's doing all the right things and not having to wait, are they going to produce 1.5 million or 2 million or 5 million or whatever it may be before you hire your second person is quite critical, critical, which again, points back to sales process, which is kind of what we focus on, key performance indicators and, and so on. So when we talk about hiring a new person or let's say a new business development person, um, how long do you guys find it usually takes to ramp that individual and, and to see success? Like what should an owner expect when they're making that first investment? I think that's pretty loaded. I, th I think yeah. let's speak to specific market. Let's start with that. So let's say we pick a market, pick a company that's trying to expand into the commercial market. And when we say commercial, let's say they're going after multifamily slash condo and maybe some class A, which is office space, right? The general mm -hmm. hire, if, it, if you're beginning to expand uh, into that vertical or mm -hmm. those verticals, would normally be that you're going to have an individual that's likely going to spend 30% of their effort into the class A sector and maybe 70% mm -hmm. of their effort into multifamily and condo. Now, why do we do this? Uh, or why that's a recommended model is because the condo and multifamily is a high frequency. So allows you to quicker understand and reap the rewards of the work. Uh, right. But again, it's lower ticket items, right? Like your the job sizes are going to be a little bit smaller than, not a little bit, they will be smaller than class A. Class A is going to be less frequent, but the job sizes are going to be bigger, right? So we want to kind of attack Attack both points, and I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. What? <laughs> Where was Adam, is, there's I think another Adam jump right in there. Adam jump, go. Yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, I think another contributing factor is the sales oh, reps that up. you're looking to ramp up. Are they from the industry or not? Right. So, right. Um, if you're bringing somebody in that might have been in one of these verticals, you hire them because you want them to go out and penetrate that vertical. You got to understand that. You got to take a step back because now they need to learn what you do as a business, what your unique selling propositions are. They're going to have to go around and train with all of your employees, sit with each department to truly understand what it is that you do and what you're bringing to the organization. And then they've got to understand all of the different nuances in terms of, you know, um, you know, the uh, industry speak, uh, if you will. So it's a little bit longer of a lead time for somebody in that situation and quite honestly, you know, over the last several months, we've seen a lot of, you know, clients and just people in general going that route in terms of going outside of the industry, mm -hmm. grabbing salespeople from these different verticals and seeing great success as long as they do take into account that there's going to be a little bit longer ramp up period for that. And that, yeah, and that ramp up, like just going back to back to that 30, 70 split salesperson, right? What we would see... When we make a commitment to a client, we're probably saying that they're going to see no later, no further out than about 90 days before they start seeing results, as in first jobs <laughs> coming in from the efforts uh, of that individual. Uh, now, do we see in some cases and number of cases where that happens sooner? Yes. Like we just had a company meeting yesterday and we have a couple of new reps that generated their first referrals in under five weeks, right? Is that the norm? Not necessarily. I think it's realistic to assume that the average sales cycle for a multifamily or condo or average sales cycle for, let's say, agent uh, sale would probably still be sitting at about eight to 12 weeks. Would you agree with that, Mark? Yeah, I, I, the hard part is, you're right, you said at the beginning, it's loaded because there's so many variables that we run into. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the the we talk a lot about the sales cycle and, and multifamily will be the quickest. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, you don't like what you get because you get a lot of small jobs and we all want the big jobs, the large losses. So, you know, you, you can see some success, but is it really getting you where you want to go? We focus a lot on the effort so that right. those first 12 weeks when there's like Lucas said, there may not necessarily be jobs coming in to say, yes, you know, we're on the board, we've got some wins. The wins are what they're doing, the meetings they're having, the follow-ups we set. That's how we can identify pretty quickly if somebody looks like they're on track to make it based on that, all that effort, because if we, if we were to get on results, there'd just be no way to do it. Or we get fooled. That first job that comes in happens to be 250,000. We go, oh, great. This is a superstar. Right. 
and you don't see anything for six months. And then, you know, we, we've set ourselves up for failure. So a lot of different ways to go. I think what, what markets you're in play a big part, their tenure, their resume as they come in um, and then you're onboarding. I mean, we could talk about it right. and, and want to get in the weeds there, but what does onboarding look like for you? Uh, we, I talk a lot with clients I work with about that and we, and we're constantly changing it and tweaking it. And if you think about what you do for production, that same stuff happens all the time, right? You can't, what you're doing 15 years ago, you don't just pull out the same playbook and say, here, learn these things and you'll be fine. Technology changes, the environment changes. We have to do the same thing with business development and we don't often do it. So you got to stay in front of it to make sure you're setting people up for success, good measurement metrics in place, good KPIs to monitor. Then the work will start to come and you'll, you know, again, you're not waiting for it. You can see it coming along the way. Yeah, I think to give a nugget to the audience, I think if you look at high frequency from all the various verticals that restoration contractors could be selling to, if you're going after the plumbers, okay, that's a very high frequency, okay, which means a rep that's selling into that uh, sector should be able to produce results within five to eight weeks, okay? You should be able to start seeing some type of losses. You look at agents, uh, you're probably looking at two to three months. Uh, being realistic, you look at multifamily or condo, HOA, you're looking at three to four months. You look at class A, you're probably looking at possible six to eight months, maybe even 12 months, right? Um, so, and these would be general, and I would include like senior living and assisted living in kind of the same the same bracket as multifamily. Um, and then we can, you know, get into schools and so on, which is lower frequency again. Very interesting insight. I know there's a lot of different verticals you can attack, and it seems like each one needs its own playbook and is almost like a different motion with potentially a different business development rep, depending on how big an investment you want to make and, and how you want to focus on uh, the specific vertical. We did have a question come through, um, which shifts gears a little bit, but we did want to talk about commission. Um, so I figured a, a you know, a question would come up just around, hey, what's your guys' thoughts on right. base commission versus variable commission? What's the split in percentage to give some owners some guidance on on what's yeah. out there and what they... Yeah, and maybe uh, while we're doing that, Roman, I don't know if we've prepared this, but uh, if you could maybe potentially pull up uh, a, our scorecard so we can speak to that as well as we talk about this, our compensation scorecard. Because, um, you know, the question is, what is a typical sales-based salary and commission structure, Right. Um, so I think what we're seeing in the industry and it goes all over the place, but I think the standard would be that it's, uh, for mitigation or high margin work, the commission structure would be somewhere around 2.5 to 3% for the reconstruction, which is kind of the lower margin work, uh, both recommendation and what we would see in the industry is 0.75 to one and a quarter. Um, salary is a very loaded question and I had a discussion with another client yesterday about this. Uh, you'd be surprised, but there's various areas of the country where the salaries need to be a lot higher. And some of you, you may think that California is it, but actually it isn't. Uh, you know, we're seeing salaries in areas like Connecticut that are way higher than in other areas, right? So I think a, a rep that has a, let's say, experience level of, let's say, three to five years in B2B sales, and I'm not talking about a rep from our industry, but maybe taking them from, from other industries. Um, you're on average going to be looking anywhere between kind of forty-five to $75,000. I know it's a wide range, but it really depends on where you are in the country. Uh, and if you add that compensation, which on average will, uh, for a company, for a restoration company, that's let's say for a rep that's bringing in $2 million or $3 million um, of business, you know that about 1 million or 800,000 of that 3 million is going to come in, is going to be mitigation. The other part is going to be reconstruction. So they're going to have a blended rate of approximately, say, uh, 2% or 1.8%. So that kind of adds to the compensation. But what's more important and what all of our clients are doing is, uh, is running our compensation model, which is salary, commission, but there's also a bonus. And I don't know, Roman, if you want to pull that up, I'll quickly speak to that and then let Mark jump in and, and Adam, um, if Roman's still there. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we, we have this concept of, uh, of making sure that we're motivating the behaviors that are being taught in our process. So 
Uh, everything we do at Sanctum revolves around the sales process, which is branded as RIPS, Restoration Industry Probe Selling. And it's the first and only sales process designed strictly for the restoration industry. Um, and it and it focuses on a concept of forecasting where we're predicting and forecasting not how much money we're going to make from a client or how much revenue, but we're forecasting number of times we are likely to have to respond for a client. So when we look at our compensation, and we have somebody that's getting paid a salary, they're getting paid their commission. There's also a component of it, which would be uh, a bonus. And in our opinion, that bonus is annual. That bonus, as you see here, which is, let's say, $17,500 bonus associated with a $3.5 million target for a, a potential rep Jane Doe, uh, that bonus is normally derived from uh, the revenue target. So on average, we would recommend that being half a percent. Uh, but the bonus doesn't get paid just because you hit the target. So the concept and idea of our comp structure is that the salesperson first or business development rep first must achieve the revenue target to qualify for the bonus, but the bonus will only get paid out if they achieve their KPIs. And if we look at KPI number two here, and I'm not going to get into too much detail on this, I'll just talk about this one KPI, um, the rep that's running on our process is taught either in our academy or is managed by our consultants, uh, over time builds a forecast. They're attaching basically how many times do they expect this relationship to call them with a referral in a period of a year, and they're building this number. And ultimately, they are responsible to make sure that the clients they put the forecast on produces minimum 80% of that. So as you see in number two here, uh, if you know Jane Doe ended the year with a forecast of 386 referrals from 87 clients, uh, we would expect in order for Jane Doe to receive 50% of her bonus, which is 8,750 bucks, to produce minimum 80% of 386 precisely from those 87 clients. And the reason we do this is because our industry is famous for celebrating salespeople that have a $5 million year or $7 million year, but I think we can all agree that anybody can stumble into a fire, right? Like anybody could come across two fires in a year and have a $5 million a year. That does not necessarily make them uh, a very good salesperson, right? So it's critical that we really understand, are the salespeople fluking or are they producing from the people that they thought they're going to be able to produce? And we have a number of uh, things that we do in order to, to measure that. So going back to I salary, commissions, and an annual bonus, which is tied to behaviors. Uh, and this is one of the behaviors. Sorry, Mark. That was no, I was actually, oh, Adam, yeah, I was actually going to say something, but I, I just didn't want you to get off of that point. Cause I think to that point of, you know, wrongfully celebrating, you know, these one-offs and stuff like that, that's kind mm -hmm. of where we're seeing this issue in our industry. And we have for years of there not being any real logic in terms of setting targets. Um, you know, you're going off of last year's number, add on 10% or add on 15 to 20% based off of last year's numbers, but you're not truly digging into the numbers. You're not looking at how much of it was cat related because we all know that you can't be dependent on cat year over year. Um, perfect example was the, was it 2021 or 2022 Texas freeze? Everybody looked like heroes that year, right? I mean, everybody's right. numbers were up 150, 200%. You, you just, you can't budget that next year off of those numbers because it's unrealistic and it's not going to happen. And that's what we're seeing uh, across the board, which is why this approach um, is, is very helpful for some of our clients. Mark, you're going to jump in with something more? No, no, I'm pulling out. <laughs> yeah, no, I, think... I, I will. I can't help myself. Okay, no, I think it, the, the big thing I want to kind of back to your original question, David, the, and the commission part of it and the salary part of it. And I, I guess another way to look at it too, in addition to all that is, I've always looked at the salary for a business development role as, especially in this business, we talked about these long sales cycles that get started. You start to get work, but you don't get it overnight. You know, your last month is going to typically be your best month when you start uh, last month of the year. So because there's that buildup, we, we, we don't want people relying on the commission their first month because they're not going to get it. So you have to have a salary that allows them to put in the time that's going to take to build up their pipeline, get those customers, but it can't be too comfortable. If it's right. too comfortable and they don't need the commission, there's, you know, that sense of urgency is not there. If it's not enough and they're scrambling and struggling, they're going to leave after a month or two if they don't land something big and get a job. So market to market, it's different. And we're always trying to toe that line of, 
you know, stay in that range where, you know, it's enough, but not too much, but we want to drive the behavior. So what Lucas just talked through was another way to look at if it's just salary and commission that helps because we want them to be wanting that commission, the bonus really rewards the behaviors that we know are actually going to drive that revenue long-term anyway. So it's rewarding them for doing the right thing, following a good process that's going to get them there, whether they agree with it or not initially, we know it'll work. They've just got to follow through and then that rewards them in the end. But the ultimate, but the ultimate goal is to make sure that you're not relying on measuring your salesperson's success strictly on revenue number, because the, you could get burnt, and a lot of people do in our industry. Because somebody again could have a three million dollar year that does not necessarily make them a great salesperson. And I think everybody that's an owner on this call can relate to the fact that you may have a blip and lots of revenue come in from a couple of fires. And then three months later, you've got a bunch of technicians and people cleaning equipment in your warehouse because you guys have nothing to respond to, right? So building the consistency and making sure that your strategy and your sales strategy actually has that in a plan is critical. And that's why salespeople that are managed by us or you know get certified in our in our academy, uh, they are taught that over a period of you know whatever amount of time, they're building their forecast and they're attaching that to specific people. So that ultimately, over a period of time, they're going to end up with a forecast of, let's say, 450 referrals, which is kind of um, uh, a goal that we try to drive every single BD to towards. Uh, and if it's somebody that's starting completely from scratch, it may even take them up to three years to do that. But there are specific markers, and we know that they should be at this point by the end of six months, three months, 12 months. Um, and by the way, a rep that has that type of forecast that we manage uh, will produce on average four to five million dollars. We, you know, to plug in our number from from last year, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, so Roman may correct me and chime in here. But we ended 2023 managing, I believe, 106 B business development reps in our consulting practice, uh, which was across, I believe, 37 companies. Mark, is that right? I believe it was 37 companies, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that. I yeah, it was yeah I believe it was 37 to, uh, 36. companies. 36. 36? Oh, there's Roman. 36 <laughs> companies. And the revenue we generated from those 106 BDs, Roman, was how much? 600? Yeah, uh, 600. Just a little bit over 600. Just a little bit over $600 million. So we've averaged uh, approximately about $6 million per rep. Now, is that normal? Probably not. Because when you look at our industry as a whole and you include you know, every restoration company out there, uh, I think the average BD in our industry is still coming in at about 500 to below a million, right? So when you look at kind of applying a process, measuring the behaviors and not just focusing on celebrating, you know, the big, big wins, but building consistency, this is what it gets you to, towards. It's fantastic. That's one of the best recommendations I've heard. I mean, I've I've been in the space myself for about seven years, and the number of times I hear, "I got a big fire. It was a a fluke," and then it's almost you know looking to repeat that same number the year after. Building in behaviors that drive the everyday success with a with a sales rep is unique and needs to be considered. So I I think uh, yeah, it's a great can... takeaway for folks listening. Right. And even if you take, a, you know, one of the major topics of why we're here today, which is like setting goals and stuff, right? Um, even when you look at a rep that has a couple of losses that they get that are bigger, the one of the concepts and things that we do when we're building targets and we're setting up goals is we will evaluate that a rep, for example, last year generated $7 million or $5 million. But the next layer of that is we got to understand how that $7 million got generated. If there are jobs in that $7 million that are a million dollar job, they need to be what we call normalized. So for the purpose of analyzing those numbers, we will take every job that's over $100,000 and we will downgrade it to a hundred grand. Not for compensation purposes because the rep will get paid on the full revenue and stuff, but it's to understand that if you remove those outliers and these home runs, what would that number look like? And Because... I'm sure that we've all done this where, you know, we look at our number as a company and what we did last year and we're budgeting for next year. And what we do is we just say, okay, another 20%, right? Well, you could be stabbing yourself in the foot right there, right? Because if you had a bunch of cats 
And now you're walking into 2023 when nothing happened, which is exactly what he experienced in 2023. All of a sudden, you know, you're, you're setting up a goal that's probably not correct. Speaking of setting goals, I find that when you set goals, uh, you can sometimes set unrealistic goals leading to like demotivation with reps, or you're almost like setting two model goals where uh, you're not like getting the true potential out of a, a sales rep. And I know you guys really focus on on this, um, you know, problem set in the industry. So how would you recommend um, setting goals that drive almost like a level playing field in the right objective that an owner is looking for? I, I would say, and I there is a question that was somewhat similar, but kind of along the same vein, I think, which is <clears throat> somebody was asking about in-person cold calling and drop-ins versus email and phone calls. Y you know, activity in this business is typically what's been rewarded. And yeah. that's how people get measured, right? If you see 10 people a day, that's success. Um, you, if you, and if you do that enough times, you're going to run into some things, right? You'll just, just by showing up, you'll, you'll get some work, get some opportunity. So we all kind of grew up in the business and that's the way it was. It was the same way when I started. That's how we measured everything. So part of what we start to do, what we do, and one of the things we really started to break down, it's part of our process that's in the, the name of it is what we call a probe meeting, which is a deep dive meeting, a discovery meeting, you know, pain point analysis type of thing where we really want to focus on having really good in-person scheduled meetings to understand what the potential is of a customer. So we start measuring, that's what we, we measure first, right? That's what our, our focus is on. We look at overall activity and there's just no, there's no way around it. It's a face-to-face -face business. So I, you're going to make phone calls, you're going to send emails. It's only to schedule meetings and get in front of people. So to me, we focus on face-to-face -face activity. We really focus on those consistent probe meetings. Uh, and there we go. The opportunity to just really understand, is this person even worth pursuing anymore? Number one. What's the potential? What am I up against? How am I going to win this thing over? And can I get a commitment to do that? So, you know, in a nutshell, that's our sales process. And so we focus on three to five of those meetings a week and really five being the goal, five or more, where if we know we consistently have really meaningful meetings where we're going to be able to do all these things and walk away with a commitment most of the time, you know, that's a good measurable, right? If I want to just measure overall activity, I'm going to get fooled. Somebody's going to send 200 emails and it's going to look like they did a lot. When in reality, they're not doing anything to really move the ball down the field. You know, they're just activity for activity's sake. So that's, and Lucas, I get, I'm sure you get, and Adam chime in on it, but that's kind of where we always start. Yeah. And then we're kind of down from there where we'll talk about if the meetings are lacking, what does the activity look like? Are we in front of enough people? Are we doing enough cold calling? Got to do the cold calling. Even if you have some kind of relationship, know the name. If they don't know you, at some point you have to show up, even though you can do everything else to, LinkedIn messaging is great. I mean, there's plenty of avenues to get there. You got to get in front of those people and you've got to have this meeting to understand, you know, really what the potential is and to make sure that they realize that we don't, they should want us as much as we want them. So right. we, this meeting is our opportunity to do that. I think, yeah, yeah I, I think, think, go ahead, go ahead on. I was going to say, I think the feet have to hit the pavement, right? I'm a big proponent right. on being out in the field versus emailing and calling, obviously to a certain extent, that's a necessary evil. Um, it's going to require you to drop into a place two, three, four times before you get that conversation with that key decision maker. Um, I feel like some of the companies that have truly kind of set aside what makes them unique, we call it USP, unique selling proposition, um, kind of like a hook, line and sinker type thing. Like if everybody has sales reps on this call that goes in and says, yeah, you know, we're, you know, Joe's restoration company, 24, seven, 365, everybody's saying that that's not a unique selling proposition. They don't want to hear that. They take your business card, put it in a pile with everybody else's and forget to tell the key decision makers that you even came in. But when you go in there, you start establishing a relationship, even if at first it's with the admin assistant, right? It doesn't matter who it's with. You just start, you know, building a relationship with somebody at that property um, or wherever you're going at the senior living facility, whoever you're trying to target, start building that relationship, tell them key differentiators about your business build that relationship. They're going to end up communicating. They might not be the decision maker. They could be an influencer. And next thing you know, when you do do that follow-up email, because you haven't been able to break in the door, your name's recognizable. And all of a sudden it's gotten you an opportunity to get your foot in the door, to sit down and ask those key questions that Mark talked about. Yeah. And to, to further that a little bit uh, to whoever asked that question, um, again, 
most of the industry for forever has been basing success or effort on number of activities, right? So what you're looking at right now is kind of the sales process that we teach and all of our clients are running on. And it's um, uh, basically follows the methodology of other sales processes, but it has been tailored specifically for restoration. And to explain further the probe meeting concept that Mark talked about, if you look at the sales process, imagine that rather than going out there and meeting people and selling on the basis of being liked, which is kind of what our industry has been doing, right? Our industry goes out, delivers donuts and branded coffee cups and uh, invites people to games and golfs with people. And the idea is to become friends with as many people as possible so that they like you enough to give you business. I mean, the strategy does work to some degree, but it's not very effective. And it's precisely why the average salesperson is producing between 500 to a million dollars and the successful salesperson in our industry, right? So when you look at our process, the concept is that we don't want to go and spend a bunch of money and time on somebody that isn't the right client for us. And we need to acknowledge the fact that not everybody is the right client for you, right? So the first step is, which is the prospect identified stage, is identify people that you know can potentially send you business. And maybe that's part of your strategy that you're going to identify, you know, multifamily uh, complexes in your area or agents or plumbers or whatever it may be. Uh, once you've identified them, your job should be to schedule a meeting with them, which means your, your rep needs to get quite comfortable being able to convey why should the client meet with you? What is the value in meeting with you? Right, because the last thing you want to do is go out and spend a bunch of time and money on this person. If you know six months later, and I use this as an example, but I had a rep once many years ago that was chasing an adjuster, and they kept saying, "Oh no, just wait a few more months, and I'm sure I'm going to start getting something." Right, and for seven or eight months, this rep was spending money taking this lady on for pedicures and this and that. And eventually the owner got upset and said, I need you to ask her, like, how come you haven't seen any, anything? And she finally did. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you knew I can't give you business, right? And it's like seven months later of spending money and time, right? So booking what we call a probe meeting, right? And scheduling a probe meeting, which is a discovery meeting where we sit down across from a client and ask a lot of questions and give ourselves an opportunity to understand what this client means to us. Can they send business? Is it sufficient? You know, are they the right person? Who are they using? What are their pain points? And so on. Eventually move to the presentation stage, which is kind of what Adam talked about, which is, uh, you know, what differentiates us? We're all in the business where we suck, clean and rebuild. So how are we different from, you know, the rainbow or service master or surf pro down the street, right? And being able to present that uh, uniqueness about us is critical. Then finally, we obtain what's called an initial commitment, which is a commitment from a client to give us a try rather than commit to giving us all their work because we haven't earned that yet. We then move to stage six, which is uh, you know the referrals received. And then stage seven, which is where we review that first job we've received and how it went. And at that point is where we place a forecast on the client that represents how many times we are likely to respond for them. So what Mike was, uh, Mark was pointing out to is the probe meetings. So we count these and these get evaluated every single week. So a salesperson would be measured on their ability to conduct, uh, you know, three to five probe meetings in a period of, of a week and maybe higher than that, depending on the tenure of the rep and, and so on. And, in order to achieve that, we know that they are likely going to need to have about you know, 20 to 30, maybe even 30 to 40 face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, but again, the main measuring uh, is going to be revolving around the probe meetings. So hopefully that answers the question. Of, for that and, and that's a formal sit down too. That's not like, hey, right. we're breezing into the office and I'm going to ask the guy Correct. up in front, in front of everybody a bunch of questions. That's not an effective way to get the answers that you're looking for to properly forecast a client. Um, so I wanted to kind of highlight that, that you want to actually have a physical appointment scheduled um, on their yeah. calendar where you show up, you sit down and you actually go through a set of questions, no matter what you call it, whether you, you're with us and you call it a pro meeting, if you just have a set of questions that you want to get answered to try to, you know, forecast on your own or however you do it, but you want to have a formal setting to sit down. And I think, you know, in our industry, especially with a lot of local reps, that's very uncomfortable. And there's this misconception that my client's not going to want to sit there like he's on a stand in front of a, a jury and answer all these questions. Eh, 
Absolutely they do. <laughs> and they actually look at all of our clients and are like, wow, I've never been asked that before. You guys are very in depth and it gives them a different perspective that they haven't experienced before. And all of a sudden they're like, this company really cares to learn everything about our business, our buildings or facilities. And they actually opened up my eyes to this forecast. I didn't realize I might have six to 12 jobs, you know, in the course of the next year, this might actually help us equip ourselves a little bit better to be able to handle a couple of them maybe. So just a different perspective. There were a few questions that came out when we were answering the, uh, the goals one and uh, Lucas, I think you brought up um, how to differentiate yourself. And a question was asked, uh, what are some unique ways to get a foot in the door, build a relationship besides everything that you kind of brought up, which is the golfing, the donuts, the tournaments. And then a part two is, do you have any recommendation on like a budget that mm -hmm. a sales rep should receive in order to accomplish some of those unique differentiators um, on their day-to-day -day kind of rounds? So I'll touch on the budget first. Uh, I think what I'm seeing, and, and again, we got to be careful how we answer this because a budget could include, um, for example, associations and member rates for BOMA and CAI and stuff. So if we're not looking at incorporating the amount of money it costs to be part of those associations and stuff, and we're looking at spending money on breakfasts, lunches, things like that, I've seen that number come in at about $500 to $1,000 a month and setting the rules of, hey, if you've got a single spending that exceeds X amount of dollars, you should get an additional uh, approval, right? Uh, this is kind of the general marker. Mark, do you see that same thing with your clients and Adam? Yeah, as I, say, I do. And I think, you know, and it is, you could, there's always exceptions and variables that you can throw in there. I think the big thing is, if the question was asking about budgets. I think you want to, you, you definitely want to set a budget. And I think in that range is realistic. And, and part of setting the budget isn't to make sure they're not, they're going over. Sometimes it's to make sure they're spending it too. Yeah. Right. So the, it, it, Lucas said it and it's true. You know, the, we're in a relationship business. That's how it's always been built. Who likes people buy from people they like that hasn't changed. What you need to do is take that, which everybody's doing. And you're elevating yourself. And so you're going to still have lunches. You're still going to have outings and dinners. That can't be the way to get in the door. Right? If you're getting, trying to get in the door by outspending somebody, there'll always be somebody with more money, a bigger exactly. budget. So you know that stuff to me is always a bit of a reward. I'd rather you be rewarding people than trying to woo people and win them over by spending a bunch of dollars on them. And there'll be like everything exceptions for it. But I think that range I like because I want to make sure you are doing those things. You are taking care of your customers. You are getting back in front of people. For a long-term customer, that may be all you do. You know, you're not going and having these deep dive meetings all the time. You will. Once a year, you're going to sit down and make sure we're doing a great job. You're still thrilled. Can we recommit you? Are you still happy? But you know, the rest of the time will be things like social events. So I want them spending the money to ensure they're doing that and being careful. We're not just throwing money at everybody trying to buy business because it won't last. It just won't stick if we do that. And, and monitoring it, right? Because I think as human beings, we all do the same things. And I'm guilty of this as, as much as anybody, which is we tend to go out and spend time and money on the few people that we become really close with because that's where the comfortable comfort is, right? Mm -hmm. And it is important to make sure that we push ourselves outside of that comfort and go and develop additional relationships, right? But uh, David, to, uh, to answer your previous question, which is, you know, what, what are some of the techniques to differentiate ourselves? Uh, I think there is no kind of magic wand Right. And I think the technique to differentiate yourself should be about the way you interact with the client. Yes, you can, you know, like over the last decade, we've seen, you know, the uptick in ERPs and priority service agreements and all that other stuff. Right. Uh, and those are great. But the minute somebody's doing it and it's got, got some success, others start doing it. And it's like whoever got there first, you know, gained some value out of it. So all of these things are great. I think it's important that we approach clients in an authentic way where we're trying to truly understand the client and what's important to them and trying to understand if we are going to be able to service them when they have a need. Because there are going to be clients that are going to rely on us for, for things that are extremely small. And you may not want to do that. You may not want to be running around to a building and adjusting doors and stuff for a client that that is eventually maybe going to send you a water loss in a multifamily complex, right? So understanding the client, and we go through this concept of playbooks, and you used that word previously, David, 
Um, we have a playbook, and if Roman's listening, maybe he can bring one of our playbooks up, but we have playbooks for every market that you could be selling to. And our playbooks guide the salesperson as to what questions they should be asking a client that allow them to understand and conceptually understand the size of that client. So when we look at a commercial playbook and we're asking, you know, how many buildings they have, how many square feet, you know, how many maintenance people are there, uh, all of these things help us understand what kind of client there are and how often could they potentially need us to respond for them, who's their portfolio manager and so on. And when you approach a client in that manner, you are already differentiating yourself. Not to say that you shouldn't have other things like we guarantee response time of an hour and you know we have people that are situated uh, and bring their trucks home and they are fully equipped and they don't have to go back to the office. So we're better this way, right? But there could be a number of things. I think it's just really important to understand why people love what you do. Like when we begin working with a client, one of the instructions that we give to, let's say a smaller sales team that we may be working with is, Go out there and talk to your technicians and talk to the people that go out and do the work and ask them, do you recall an event where a client was extremely grateful for what you've done or was blown away with a service we provided? Can you, can you tell me about that? And that's the fastest way to learn what it is that you're doing that is unique and that is different. Aside from change the approach uh, on how you're communicating with the client and acknowledge the fact that not every client will be the right client, which means you need to have a conversation and you need to have a meeting to determine, are they even open to working with you? I see so many salespeople go out there and keep knocking on the same door. And then months, you know, a year later, they found out that the property manager is married to a guy that owns a franchise of a rainbow. You know what I mean? Like, how do you not know that from your first interaction with the client? Why don't you know that? Like that needs to happen very fast. Sorry, Mark, do you have anything else to add or Adam? Yeah, and the only thing I was going to add is I, um, you know, looking at the playbook and, and you know, there's lots of different sections. We have a section on there about current providers. It's a com competition. We're always trying to figure out what do they like about them? Because, we, you know, we want to figure out what they like and make sure we do that. We're really trying to figure out what aren't they getting, right? And what can we provide it? Adam said it a few times earlier, the what's your unique selling proposition? What makes you different and special? The reason they're going to want to go to you because there are a lot of companies that do what we do, and there's a, and a lot of companies that do it well. So it'd be nice if all the competition was terrible. It'd be a lot easier to sell. But sure. you know, there's companies that do a good job. You got to look internally, and everybody on the call should be. I think one good takeaway is, if you haven't already, go identify what makes you really that different. And it shouldn't be that we're 24 seven, we're after hours. You know, like Lucas said, we suck clean and rebuild. If it's the same thing your competitor does, there, there's no advantage, right? That's just the baseline that everybody gets into. You're looking to be that that company that's special, that's different. Like in Division One football, there's 134 teams in Division One football, but there's only one that's a national champion this last year, right? So, yes. you know, I just – you want to be that company. You want to be the Michigan football this year uh, out in your market, right, where everybody recognizes you, knows you, and you're special. So that's just, just the takeaway for everybody. I think one one thing to add about the communication, right? When your sales reps are out there and they finally get that opportunity to speak to the decision maker, be it at the front or if they actually give them five minutes to sit down at a cubicle or something like that to do the initial pitch, pitching the fact that, look it, I understand you might have existing relationships. I'm not looking to be, you know, your exclusive provider. Um, understand that if a strong weather event came through, whether it was cat or anything like that, how are they going to be able to scale up and you know serve you if you're talking to somebody that has multiple properties and something like that? I'm just looking to give you a different perspective. We take a totally different approach than the people around us in the industry. They're all good. They're all great. We know a lot of them. Um, just looking for that opportunity to sit down, ask you some pointed questions to truly understand if, number one, it's an opportunity for us, but more importantly, it's an opportunity for you. It might, we might not be an opportunity for you, and that's completely okay. But that's why a 25 minute conversation will prevent me from coming back in here and harassing you for the next six to eight months. Let's just get it out of the way. Not that you say that, but just, you know. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going back to the, the process that Roman brought up on screen, I think we had a question come through and it might just be like a definition question based on your guys' process that you uh, built out here. 
but the question is what's the definition of a closed client mm -hmm. um, when yeah. they're looking at resulting referrals from a closed client? I'm sure you guys that's, a, a lot. that's a great question. Somebody's really paying attention here because this is precisely why uh, our industry hasn't really had a sales process. Uh, some of you may have heard of Sendler Systems, which you know uh, was pretty predominant in our industry. Some people were learning that stuff. But the reality is when you look at Sendler, Miller Hyman, spin selling, solution selling, all these sales processes are built around the possibility of selling a widget. And that's not what we do. We're in an in industry where you're selling to an influencer and to somebody that doesn't have anything necessarily give you right then and there, uh, you're not ending the meeting with a check for a million dollars. So your hope is that your sales process takes you through a series of predefined sequence of steps uh, to convert a client from, uh, convert somebody from being a potential client to being somebody that trusts you and will pick up the phone and call you when they actually do have an event. Right. So when we look at our stage seven, which is closed first job reviewed, again, if you pay, if you take a look at this, we start with identifying a prospect, we book a probe meeting, we then conduct a probe meeting where we go through this playbook of questions. We ask a series of questions and the intent of the probe meeting is not only to learn everything about the client, but it's also to determine that this client has the potential of having about four events a year or three events a year or one event a year, whatever it may be then eventually presenting to them with what makes us different and how it speaks to whatever we've learned about them and their pain points. Then eventually we go to, hey, are you willing to give us a try? Because just like Adam said, we can't be going in there uh, with you know heavy guns and going, hey, give us all your work. We haven't earned that right. So what we say to the client is, hey, based on what I've just shown you, it appears that you're pretty excited about some of these things that we do that may be different from what you've experienced. Hey, would you be willing to give us a try? And if the client says that, he says, yes, we coach the salespeople to precisely say, perfect. So based on that, are you willing to commit to giving me your next job? And the key words over there are commit and next. And that would be the stage five. And when the client says yes to that, we advance to stage five. We also come up with a anchoring of a date. So we go through this process where we com communicate with the client about, you know, how much time could possibly go by before we could work with them on that first referral. We then get that first referral, which is stage six. And then the closed stage seven is where we come back. And after that first job has been completed and done, we sit down across from the client and go, hey, did we deliver every, everything like I said we would? Was the experience everything I promised, right? And if the client says yes, we then take that conversation all the way to, hey, you may recall back when we met, I showed you what makes us different. And one of the things that makes us different is this concept of forecasting, where we're predicting how many times we are likely to have to respond for you. And this has nothing to do with necessarily making money because we're not predicting revenue because we have no idea whether you call me on a $1,000 job or a $50,000 job. But we know that as we build our client base and as we add a client that may have three times that they may need us per year, this one five times, when we hit certain thresholds, our ownership needs to invest further in the production hire people, buy trucks, buy more equipment, right? So they start understanding why we're doing this. This logically makes sense. So at stage seven, we reconfirm, now that you've had this experience, are you now willing to become a client? And this is the stage where we would potentially sign things like an ERP or a priority service agreement, not at stage four or five, which is where the rest of the market's doing it and why the rest of the market is seeing a 5% success rate with ERPs and priority service agreement and we're seeing 40% or 45% success rate. Also at stage seven, when we conduct that first job review is where we get the client and ask to agree, hey, based on what we've talked about, we agreed that you may have about three events a year where you, you may need us to respond to, is that still correct? And ultimately that's where we place the number on the client, that is the closed stage. Hopefully that answers it. And I, I think just to piggyback off of that really quickly, I think the issue in the industry that we see right now, and, and Mark, I'm sure can attest to this, we sit down with new clients, we ask what their, you know, vision of a client is. And it's a client that gave them one job back in 2022. And they're saying that that's a client, that's not a client, right? So that's why we take the process that Lucas just went over to truly determine what the potential is and that they're going to actually commit verbally to giving you that in the future. Right. 
All right, we had a couple more questions come through live here that I want to get to with about 20 minutes to spare here. So we have um, a question going back to any experience or success hiring someone that has expertise in both sales and marketing for one role, or uh, should you know you focus on more of the core discipline of sales or marketing? My favorite question. Yeah, that's where I'm going to jump in because we'll, we'll chew up the last 20 minutes <laughs> right. with Lucas talking. No, um, <laughs> to, to we, the way we look at it, and even sales, it, it can be viewed differently because sales, there can be sales yeah. where your project manager estimator is selling a job to a homeowner. We So we kind of call sales business development. If we're looking for repeat customers, you know, those decision makers that can pick up the phone and call us in. Marketing has a place and there's it has a big place today, especially you know, if you're utilizing Google reviews and, you know, you want your name and your brand out there, Lucas has our Sanctum shirt. You saw when we pulled up our pipeline, it's, it's you know, has our RIPS process on there and it's branded. So there's a big place for marketing. The problem is very few people can do both well. You're going to have one or the other that you're going to really excel in or feel more comfortable with. And I would say typically anybody that's doing marketing will feel more comfortable because that's the, the path of least resistance, right? I don't have to go knock on doors, cold calling, get no's. Get people tell me they're not going to work with me. So uh, I have, we definitely have business development people that, that put their toe in the water and help out with social media, help out with some marketing. But usually we're always trying to pull that away and say, just go, we want you in front of customers. What we don't want you to do is trying to come up with a post and some content. Uh, somebody needs to do that. The companies need, your company needs that. You got to have the branding and the awareness and the name recognition, but it's really hard to get somebody that does both well. So I would, I would prefer Hire a business development person to go get that business and find somebody else in the company, administrative, you know, even, even a production person, if they've got the time, right? If you're growing and you're building up that maybe has a little bit of a knack for it, but don't take your, your business development people away from what they're really good at. Because one of the things we should have probably brought this up earlier, I don't know if it's too late, if we want to, uh, if we can bring up the revenue calculator. Because it, it, it really just kind of illustrates what we look at. Mm -hmm. Because it the reason we talk about we can know in 12 weeks if somebody has a chance to be successful or not, it, this is our revenue calculator. So we can go over this I, I kind of quickly, but it, there's some different variables, inputs that we put in. Uh, your average job, your conversion from a lead to actually winning the job, you know, things like that that will impact it. This one is built on five probe meetings a week. And if you're doing that consistently... For the first 12 weeks, we, we have very little expectation of revenue because of the sales cycle, the time it takes. And you're, if you're having five meetings a week, you have to you have to wait till you have enough people in the pipeline before you actually start to see some results out of that. So, you know, we want people in front of those customers because if they if they have a week or two without any of those meetings where this line is going to be pretty flat and pretty low for 12 weeks, now it's 14 weeks and it's 16 weeks. And so instead of this hockey stick curve up where revenue really starts to hit at the end, the, the, when you don't have meetings because you're tied up with social media or marketing or reviews and, and all the other things that pull you out of the field, this this never takes off like that. It just stops and starts and flat lines and sometimes goes backwards. So it's not really about this week, right? So when you don't go and have meetings this week, it's not you're not going to lose the revenue this week. You're going to lose the revenue a month or two months or three months from now from those relationships you should have been building, cultivating, or asking for the commitment today. So really, to me, that's, I know this isn't really, the, but I was a good no, visual good. for the answering that question. Like that's for the, the, the drawback of having somebody get away from anything other than business development. And let's keep this up for a second, because I think that if there's one thing the audience should take away from this and from the question that David just asked is if you have a business development slash salesperson that's supposed to go out there and do business, if you ask them to do anything else, other than go do business development, they will end up using that something else as an excuse for not doing the things that they should be doing in business development. So if you want to avoid having that mistake, when you hire somebody, leave them alone to only doing business development and sales. Uh, you are more likely to, and by the way, it's a, uh, you know, characteristics and a personality trait traits that don't really match up. It's unlikely that you will find somebody that's a go-getter and a hunter and somebody who goes out there and is an aggressive salesperson and they also going to be very good at doing marketing or vice versa. It will happen occasionally, but you'd be better off getting an administrative person that's potentially answering your phones and things like that, doing some administrative work. They are more 
in line with being able to potentially also do some of that social media marketing and stuff like that. And then going back to this uh, revenue calculator, and um, and I'm not sure who's who's pointing to things here. Is it you, Roman? If it is, yes, maybe... it is. Yeah, okay, yeah, you perfect. are. So if you could, highlight something. Yeah. Yeah, if you could uh, go through this with me. So I want to explain this because what you guys are looking at here, this is the minimum standard that we achieve when it comes to managing salespeople, when we as consultants are managing a sales team for a restoration contractor. So what you're seeing in front of you is an example of a revenue calculator for a salesperson that's spending 70% of their effort in multifamily and 30% in class A, which would be office space, which is kind of what I touched on previously. This company that we're using as an example has an average job size of $12,800. And that includes, that's an average both uh, across all the service lines. So that's between recon and mitigation. They are converting 72% of the leads that are coming in into jobs. This rep has not inherited any new accounts. So they are starting completely from scratch. There's no owner there that gave them 20 relationships that are already producing. And this rep is conducting five probe meetings on average per week, which is kind of our minimum standard that we expect the rep to do. If we assume that this rep comes on board and spends 30 days of onboarding, which means they're not selling during that 30 days, they are doing what Adam was pointing to previously, which is they're driving along with your technicians, learning the business because they didn't come from our industry. They're understanding the systems and all that stuff. And let's say they go on the road and start selling on the 31st day. And let's assume in the worst case scenario, it will take them three to four months to generate that first job, okay, from all their effort, which means they're not even going to generate that first referral till month five, which means they are not going to be, they're only in the first 12 months of employment, they're only going to be producing seven months. I don't know what that line was all about, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they're only producing for seven months. In that first seven months or 12 months of employment, seven months of producing, this rep will produce no less than $658,000. That same rep by the end of year two will produce no less than 2.3 million and no less by three, by year three, no less than 3.7. And by year four, that, le that rep will produce no less than $5 million a year. Now, to some of you, this may seem like a, like a large number, but when you look at making sure that you're giving clear direction, clear instruction, and you're allowing your salespeople to celebrate successes that they have control over, which is how many probe meetings they have, how effective was that probe meeting, how many commitments they've received, rather than just focusing on how many jobs they got. We need to get them away from celebrating only when they're getting jobs because there will be times where they go a week without a job. And sometimes reps will turn around and start doubting themselves. And the minute they start doubting themselves, they start you know, smelling of desperation and like, they sound different on the phone. They appear different when they go to meetings. We need to eliminate that. We need to trust that what we're asking them to do is being done right and keep that going consistently. And this is precisely why we are able to hit these numbers and others in the industry are not. Adam, anything to add? Or... There was another question. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, David. No, no worries. There was, there was another question that came through, which is, which should I throw in the towel on reps that aren't performing? And I think this graph could almost paint a picture and tell the story of when you should provide some color on that question, if you if you will. Yeah, we so we we will determine if a rep's going to be successful in under twelve weeks, maximum fourteen. Okay. Now again, we are able to do this because one, we get involved in your hiring, so we have a very precise and specific process for how we hire salespeople. We use a methodology called who the a method for hiring by jeff smart and randy streets uh, which is a book so for those of you that are on here maybe we can maybe roman can post uh, the link to the book on amazon i ran luxor the the whole company on this and i attribute a ton of our success to being able to hire the right people because i think everybody that's an owner on this call can relate to the fact that if we could just have a players in our in our organization the there's no limits, right, of, of growth, right? So hiring the right people is, is is pretty critical. And I'm sorry, what was your question, David? And what was I going with this? When to, when to throw in the towel. When to when throw, to throw in, in the towel, the towel. So, yeah. so yeah, so hiring the right people is one. And then like, so when, when we hire somebody, we establish that in the first few weeks, they need to start being able to book meetings, right? After they've onboarded, right? 
once we establish that they are able to book meetings, we immediately move to, well, how deep can they take those probe meetings? Because we evaluate every probe meeting, right? Then we, in you know week five, six, we're able to determine, are they able to convert good probe meetings into commitments that the client's willing to commit to giving us their next event as a trial job, right? So all of these things are being tracked on weekly basis and it allows us to know if the rep is on pace or not. So we will make that determination in 12 to 14 weeks, but it does require tracking and managing the rep precisely the way that I'm describing. And I'm giving you a very high level answer here. Um, our industry mm -hmm. is terrible at this, okay? Because our standards, we, we run these ROI, return on investment calculators for certain clients. And this is one of our use cases that we use all the time, where if you're working with us and we get somebody that's not performing out of there in 14 weeks and without us, it would take you 18 months. If you look at that cost and then you add opportunity cost to that, it's enormous, right? So hiring the right person, tracking them correctly and knowing what they need to be doing and being able to exit them in you know, 12 to 14 weeks or what we would say coach up or coach out okay is pretty critical and that would be and, that would be the right right standard and that's why we promote you know starting with a minimum of two salespeople um, right. or business development reps because oftentimes one of those reps is not going to work out and if you don't properly equip yourself with a minimum of two now you're going all that time without any type of salesperson you finally get somebody and on average we find that high you know going out you know, whether you're doing it yourself locally, getting a headhunter, doing all of the interviewing process, sending, you know, uh, an offer letter, them accepting, submitting two notice, you know, uh, two weeks notice, uh, you're looking at three months till you get somebody in there onboarded mm -hmm. up and mm -hmm. going. So now you've just lost three and a half, four months on top of, well, the industry is a lot different than what we do, but on top of the 90 days that you wasted only having one rep and them not working out. So that's another reason why we really promote at least two. And then, of yeah. course, there's like, where do you hire from, right? Like, that's a common question. A lot of restoration owners think <clears throat> that they can cut the corner by hiring a rep that worked at another restoration company. And they didn't produce there, but they're going to produce for you. What makes you think that, right? Or they're going to bring you all the business. Let me tell you that the most I've ever seen of transferring from where a rep had a book of business with a certain company and they came to work for another company, the most I've seen them bring over is about 15%. And this would be considered successful. So don't fool yourself or don't let somebody fool you to tell you that you can go and hire somebody from a different restoration company and they're going to bring you $5 million worth of work. If it was that easy, everybody be doing it. And we tend to hire from outside of the industry. Would you Would you guys agree, uh, Mark? Like, where are you interviewing from mostly for your Yeah, clients? and honestly, yeah. I mean, there's, it, there's. Boy, we could go down, we don't have a, enough time to go on that. But that, you know, if, you, if you're going into property management, there's a pros and cons to hiring from somebody already in that world, whether they're selling for a different company, like a, you know, pest control or landscaping, or if they're a property manager. But generally, yeah, we're kind of looking for fresh people with the right traits, right? If, with the right. things that we don't have to worry about teaching them because their personality, uh, their organization, their follow-up, those things all fit the profile we're looking for. We can teach them restoration. We're not worried about that, but we don't want to have to teach them how to sell. If we're doing that, then we're, you know, it's going to take us much longer. And the one thing I would add to what Lucas said that kind of ties to this, this graph a little bit, we focus on that 12 to 14 weeks for a couple of reasons. One of them is we work with a number of recruiters too. Right. And they've got that 90 day window where, you know, we will replace that person. So, you know, to, to figure that out in three months is pretty important. And so we're trying to, you know, as soon as you can do that, it doesn't mean we always walk away and just say, fire them on the spot. And like Lucas said, well, we try to coach them up. We have owners that, that say, listen, I think it's the right person. We've got to do things some different, a little different than we're doing. So you want to work with people, but you have to identify that and know whether that means we've got to put in some more time or it's a case of a recruiter you know, we want to get that other, we're just going to get a new person in. We recognize that it's not what we're looking for. You know, they're not able to follow through on their commitments to us, let alone our customers committing, you know, so lots of reasons why that window is important if we can identify it quick enough. But it all starts with hiring the right person and increasing that ratio. That's number one, which again, uh, I don't know if Roman posted here about who the A method for hiring, but um, you guys can look that up. 
or Roman, if you can post it, that'd be great. Um, oh, yeah. uh, okay, perfect. Said. Thank you. So hiring the right person to hire the right person, you got to interview correctly. And that book will totally teach you how to do that and how to remove your emotional gut feeling concepts of, of hiring the wrong person. Uh, then onboarding them, which is another one, which is really important that it's done correctly. And there is a specific structure for how you should onboard a salesperson. Then giving them very clear instructions. I, you know, I always say this when I speak at other events, uh, when you interview salespeople, uh, and you ask them a question, you know, what did you not like about your previous job or your boss or what was an issue? Why did you leave? Right. Most common answer from a salesperson is going to be, oh, they were micromanaging me, right? Like micromanagement is like the devil world in, in, in the sales world, right? So uh, in reality, salespeople actually thrive when they are given very clear direction from an individual that they trust, okay? So giving them structure, giving them direction, giving them instructions so that they can gauge whether they're doing the right things is more critical than, than anything else. And if you attach all this and then add compensation to it, accountability, coaching, this is how you build a successful salesperson. And reference checks. The question I'll I... just give that as a little, the little it's caveat, in the book. right? Reference in checks. the book. <laughs> it, it's in the book, so get the book, but reference checks is a big one. And the minute that you tell them that you're actually going to be following up with their former boss and what's their name and number, a lot of them get all tense and get all beat red and everything like that. And that's a quick way to just siphon through and not waste your time. Yeah. It's like <clears> they <throat> say, a resume is an embellished, it's a, it's a series of embellished successes with all this failures hidden and, and not disclosed. Right. So yep. yeah, it's important to get through that. Right on. We're going to pull on that string for a minute or two longer, but there was someone that asked, um, it sounds like it's a manager and we were talking about onboarding a minute ago and they just said, Hey, what are some, some ways that I can set up my sales rep for success? Like what are the top three ways? If you guys are open to sharing some secret sauce uh, from an owner top down, hiring a sales rep, how can they set them up for success? Transparency, right? Um, giving them a set of KPIs, um, oversight right accountability i think that would be number two and then i'll leave number three to one of the other two um but i think <laughs> accountability is the big thing that this industry is lacking um you know top to bottom uh, accountability of the sales team you know go out and do this and then you know you go through your you know you have companies that have basic kpis you know i think mark mentioned it earlier okay we're checking the box i did 25 phone calls this week 10 office visits and stuff like that those aren't true KPIs. Those are just checking the boxes, going through That's the right. motions, hoping that you get a big loss. You need to actually have KPIs with purpose behind them. Right. And you need to have somebody that is actually managing those, collaborating with the salesperson, right? Not just telling them that they have to go do something and then sitting back and yelling at them when they don't do it. Collaborate with them, explain why they have to do something, explain what the benefit's going to be for them. Uh, from a professional standpoint, what it's going to be for you as their manager and what it's going to mean overarching for the uh, company as a whole. Yeah, like, I, I would add to that, that like not to plug ours completely in, but there's three ways that you can learn this. And there is a way to interact and learn our stuff for free. We do a quarterly webinar where you can learn something from our academy every single quarter. Now, our academy is a six months or five months academy where weekly you're attending a class where you're part of a 20 person cohort and you're learning every aspect of all of everything we do in our consulting. So if you're not a consulting client, you can learn everything in our academy. But if you don't want to be part of the academy because there's cost obviously associated with that or whatever, maybe the reason you can participate in our free webinars where you can learn this. If you don't have the ability to give your salesperson clear direction, you need to look outside of your organization to that. Do not hope that your salesperson is just going to figure it out. Or if they do uh, and they're extremely successful, then they have an entrepreneurial mindset and they're unlikely to stay with you. Or if they somewhat succeed, they are going to be the half a million to a million dollar rep. If you want them to be a true salesperson and be a six million, five million dollar rep consistently every single year, then they need to be provided the tools. It's just like your technician. You hire somebody off the street, you can't, make them a very good technician without putting them through certain education and, 
and certain components of it to understand everything. It's the same thing with sales. We can't rely on sales being about just becoming friends with people. It just doesn't get us to those numbers. Yeah, I the one thing I would add in because I I'm currently teaching our academy, so some of this is pretty right. fresh. And and one of the things we've talked a lot about so far is the value of that one on one meeting with your business development person. And Adam hit it. I mean, that's where the accountability takes place when the expectations are going to meet every week. We're going to review what you did. If I give you tasks, and that's a big part of it too, for somebody brand new, give them some tasks. Give them the task of building a list of a hundred companies that they're going to go target. Even if they don't know anything about anything, they can do that, right? And that's your your first clue, can they follow through on something I've given them? And then let's talk about it. We'll talk about the ability to set up meetings. Can they get meetings set without that experience? So you, you those would be the first two things that kind of answer that question is, you know, give them a task of, of building out a list of prospects and then have them start building, setting up meetings from that list. That's a great way to get started, but you've got to have that meeting where they know you're going to meet, you're going to talk. They need coaching. They need help, whether they'll admit it or not. So there's an opportunity every week to talk through struggles, challenges, successes, but also then, did you do what we asked you to do? Have you followed through on your commitments? Accountability. To, yeah, three to five pro meetings a mm-hmm. week. And when your customer commits, are you following back up with that customer? You know, my my big soapbox is always we where we fall apart, where we fail is in the follow through. Yeah. So we get, we're great at having meetings and getting people to say yes. Then we go do something else that because they'll call eventually, right? And they don't. So if we can get them in the habits of doing that, and our job as managers are to make sure that they are following up with their customers and they're following through and they're working people through the system, through the pipeline. And you, ha- you got to have that meeting. You got to be really diligent of it. You've got to stick to it. Try not to move the day and the time. You know, we all have things that come up. We're in the restoration business, so there'll be exceptions, but stick to it as close as you can so that we know that's going to happen every week. And that helps build that culture of accountability um, and also just, you know, again, the coaching, the training and, you know, a good environment. The consistency, to right? It, it, yeah. It's a consistency. It, there's, this is no different than working out. There is a reason why people have a hard time committing to going to gym. But the minute they start pay, paying a personal trainer, they will roll out of bed and make that appointment because they're like, I'm out 70 bucks. I might as well go do it. Right. So it's uh, it, it's no different. And salespeople need it. I know we want them to be self-motivated, but. It is tough if you're going out there and facing rejection, uh, you know, 50%, 60% of the time, it's not an easy world. And to lay it out in steps, first thing you want your salesperson to be able to demonstrate to you is the ability to put together a target list. Okay. It doesn't matter what market you're going after, have them put together a list with addresses, organize it in geographical structure that's logical and where they're going to go and so on. Number two. Can they, con- can they convert an interaction into an actual scheduled meeting where they have to be able to convey to the client, potential client, why they should meet with them and then start tracking if they're booking meetings, what percentage of the meetings are actually occurring, how many of them are being canceled? Because sometimes people will give you a meeting and they have no intentions of keeping that meeting. They just want to get you out the door, which tells you that your salesperson doesn't know necessarily how to convey the value in why the client should meet with them, which is something you would need to work on with them. Then it's like, how deep do they go in the meeting and on and on. So on the surface, managing salespeople seems seems quite easy. Oh, we'll meet with them once a week and go, how are things going? But if that's what you're doing, the response you're going to be getting when it's slow, oh, it's slow. Nobody's getting any work. What well, We know that that's not the case. So we know that you know people are getting work, right? There's work always happening, right? Our industry is famous for the fact that if there is a cat or just a lot of things going on, even the crappiest restorer will be busy. The question is, can you stay busy when things aren't happening in the industry, when there is no cats and so on? And you should be able to maintain that. Maybe not the same numbers, but there should be a threshold that you should be maintaining. Well, gentlemen, we're up at the hour and a half mark. I want to make sure that those that are still on with us are able to contact you folks, follow along. We have the LinkedIn URL at the top right, Facebook as well. And then there's a little bit of a promo, special promo I talked about at the start of this webinar that Sanctum's offering. Pull out your camera, scan the QR code, and maybe just in a couple seconds, uh, could someone from Sanctum kind of give a, a little bit of a clue to what this special promo is offering? Roman, that'll be you since you've put this together. 
<laughs> yes, yeah, no, of course. Um, yeah, no, just uh, yeah, scan the QR code. It gets you to our webpage where you can get more information about our services and also um, a way to uh, fill out the form and be more than happy to spend uh, some extra time with you, jump on a discovery call, try to uh, understand you and your needs, and maybe you have more questions that we can answer. And yeah, we have like a special promotion for people who attend this webinar, which is specifically for the Sanctum Sales Academy. And um, yeah, we're more than happy to share with you guys uh, more about that. But really two two items, right? There is a discount for the Academy and I don't remember what the discount was. You can maybe touch on that. 50%, Roman, but yeah, 50%, 50% on the, on the so second. Wow. So 50% of the second attendee in the Academy uh, is off if you attended the webinar. And then second part is that you can book an individual call with us and we can help you assess your individual situation and just tell you maybe what you could do or what what are some of the steps that you may, may want to take as next steps, right? Uh, so that you're not jumping too far ahead, but but also not missing the boat on something. Highly recommended booking a discovery call with these guys and also joining the Sales Academy. There were a lot of questions, unfortunately, that we weren't able to answer even in the hour and a half time frame here. So if you do have a question for these guys, uh, please book a, a discovery call with them. Um, it's free. They're happy to provide you know their expertise. And uh, with that, we'll wrap things up just with a quick plug for the next upcoming event that we're hosting here with Ken Larson. Ken Larson. There's a live Q&A happening uh, June 6th for an hour and a half. If you haven't already registered, QR code bottom left of the screen. You can also go to our website to register as well. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Lucas, David, Mark, yeah, and Adam thank you for, for sharing having your expertise us. with me. Yeah, thank you for having us. And thank you to all the attendees. Yes, thank you, everybody. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. All righty. Take okay. care.